you will turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Be in Luke chapter 8. We've been talking about how do we hear from God, and as we come to the Lord's table today, we want to talk about um, some attitudes that may hinder us from hearing from God. Um, I went into, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pack rat. I kind of keep things for nostalgic reasons. I kept this. Feels so small. Such a little dainty phone. Um, unfortunately, this has gotten a new name. We don't call it a phone anymore. We call it the dumb phone. Because it's not a smartphone. Now, what's the difference between the smartphone and the dumb phone? Internet, Internet and the bill. <laughs> Internet and the bill. And, and both of these phones are really amazing. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it. You know, when I was growing up and I saw Captain Kirk talking to somebody on the planet face to face, I thought that was awesome. And now we can do it. It's amazing. But I don't know if you've ever thought about this. All those Wi-Fi signals are bouncing around in this room. All the phone signals are bouncing around in this room. TV signals are bouncing around in this room. Radio signals are, this room is filled with every kind of wave coming at us. And the most interesting thing about it is you can pick it up if you have the right frequency, if you will. Your phone is only as good as the signal. Um, they used to have that commercial. Can you hear me now? That was code for, do you have a signal? Because this doesn't work unless you have a what? Signal. And you can't receive the signal unless you've got a reception. If you have something to access that signal, if you will. Here's the good news. God's signal is strong. God's signal is constant. God is trying to talk to us all the time. Not only that, we talked about the wisdom of God last week. He has given us all the same access. He was brilliant in doing it this way. I've had people ask me this. Why couldn't he just wrote on the sky? Why couldn't he talk to us audibly? Because then we don't have all the same access, do we? Some would have better access than others, better reception, if you will, than others. So what he did is he put everything that we needed, we talked about this last week, that pertains to life and godliness in a book. And everything he needs to tell us is in this what? Book. And then what he does, Jesus says, it's better for me to go away than to stay. Because if I go away, I can send one. He's talking about what? The Holy Spirit. And he will come into you. And he will teach you everything that I have said. So he, he helps us understand this truth. So if we have a strong signal and we all have access, then why is it that we may not be hearing God? It may be the reception. Yeah, that was funny. It was the reception. <laughs> Man, I couldn't have paid for that. <laughs> um, listen, there are things we can do that cuts off our reception. And it's our attitudes. It's a lot of things, actually. We're just going to talk about a few as we come to Lord's Table Day. And the reason we're doing it at the Lord's Table is, hopefully as we examine ourselves before we go to the Lord's Table, we might be able to say, Lord, this is true of me and I need to repent of it. Lord, this is something in my life that I see now. Your Holy Spirit show me and I need to repent of it. If you would look with me at uh, Luke chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 4. Jesus is teaching. It says, and when, the, when a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. And the sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock. As, it soon, as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, He who has an ear, let him hear. Now, his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? Now, here's something interesting. 
Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear. And then his disciples come to him and says, we don't understand. When we were, uh, when I was taking martial arts, and if you have a really good martial art teacher, they're not just teaching you how to fight, they're teaching you how to think. And so what he would do is when he started a class, any good instructor, when he has a big class, the first thing he does is he punishes them with workouts and stances. And, and, and what that does is it thins out that crowd. Because what you're left with are the ones that are really serious about what they want to learn. And then as he began to teach you things, he would say things that didn't make sense. He would say things like this. You know, sometimes it's better to pull than to push. And he would leave it in the air. And what he was doing is he was trying to determine who was the serious student. Because a serious student would come up to him later and say, what did you mean by it's better sometimes to pull than to push? And he said, well, this is what it means. And he would teach you. Sometimes when they're coming at you, instead of trying to push them back, just pull them toward you and throw them. Use their momentum against them. And then he would give you a life lesson. It's kind of like this in life. There's times in life when things will come against you and sometimes we try to stand and fight against it when actually we just need to go with it a little bit and see how it plays out. Sometimes it's better to pull than push schools. And you go, ah, that's what Jesus is doing here. He tells a parable. What does that have to do with anything? Think about it. If you heard, see we know what the background is, many of us, what this is. But a first time here wouldn't know what he's talking about. What? What's up with the seed? And what is it with some getting choked out and some falling away and birds? That, what does this mean? And that's what the disciples are doing. Verse 10, and he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And that's a simple way of saying this unrevealed knowledge. Disciples, I'm going to give you something that has been hidden as I told this parable. But to the rest it is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And then he begins to explain. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is what? The Word of God. Now we know what the seed is in the parable. The Word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the Word out of, from, out of their hearts. Lest they, should be, lest they should believe and be saved. He goes on to say. I'll read it from my notes. He goes on to say, But the ones on the rock, verse 13, are those when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time when the temptation fall away. Verse 14. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those when they heard go out and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Verse 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you did not leave us guessing about life. You didn't leave us guessing about how to live. Father, you didn't give the church instructions so that we could guess how to do church. You were very specific. But Father, you've given us your word, we all have access to it. The problem is sometimes, Father, we have attitudes that makes us, makes us not hear it. We're not receptive to it. Father, as we talk about these soils and talk about attitudes this morning, I pray that you would confront us and convict us that we may hear from you through your word and that we can walk with you. Father, I thank you for the power of your word and the promise of that power. I thank you that you've given it to us. And I pray we not lay it aside, but that we would memorize it, meditate upon it, and most importantly, live it out so we do not deceive ourselves, as James talks about, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first part of this parable, and I, it's not so much an attitude as much as a warning. I want y'all to write this down. Number one, this is another reminder why prayer is so important in the hearing of God's Word and witnessing. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is so important in the hearing of God's Word and witnessing. Because the very first thing that Jesus talks about is what? 
Satan. The wayward soil is soil that, and I want you to remember this too, is usually was, was a footpath. It was usually narrow and hard where people walked back and forth. Um, one of the tornado victims, their drive is real bad, so they drive in the field, and you can see the tire marks in the field now. The rest of the field is pretty soft, but not where that is. That's almost as hard as the driveway. Why? Because it's gone back and forth, back, and it's been worn down. It's hard. And so when this sower is sowing and it falls on that soil, does the seed go into the ground and kind of sit on top where it's hard? It sits on top where it's hard, and it says the birds just kind of come down and what? And it says that, Jesus says, that is Satan who comes and plucks out the word so that it won't bring life. Seed brings life. And Satan comes and plucks it out. And Satan does that a lot of ways. But the major way, and I want you just to, to think about this just for a second. The major way he does that is because our heart or our soil, if you will, is hard. Sometimes that's things we've done ourselves and sometimes that's things that have been done to us. You know the biggest thing I've seen that keep people coming from God? is hurt in their life. Someone's hurt them or betrayed them. They have bitterness or unforgiveness in their life. Or worse yet, and some of y'all are in this room have had this happen to you. You were, were molested or abused. And in the back of your head, your soil got hard. And this is what you said. Why did God let it happen? And there's some anger toward God. And there's some lack of trust toward God. Because if God can't handle that, how can I expect Him to handle this? We forget that came, a lot of that came from sinful man acting against God and acting against God's Word, an agent of Satan. We don't get mad at Satan. Isn't that amazing we don't get mad at Satan? We get mad at who? God. And so when it hits, we just don't hear it. Some of it's pride. Listen, I'm going to meddle this morning. We're coming to the Lord's table. I need to do some of that. Some of the hardest, unteachable Prideful people are Christian in the church. I know what is right. My way is right. Your way is what? My way of interpreting is right. My way of thinking is right. Your way is? And we're totally closed off. We refuse to hear anything different because if I admit that you might be right, then I have to admit that I might be. And pride keeps us from hearing what God's trying to tell us. John Piper talks about this in different ways Satan uses to keep God's word from going out. I'm going to read it directly. He says, Satan works overtime to keep people giving serious attention to the word of God. He may keep them up late Saturday night so they can't stay awake during the sermon. I know who y'all are, by the way. Uh, can't stay awake during the sermon uh, or during Sunday school. He may put a dozen distractions around you during the service to take your mind away from the message. He may send thoughts into your mind about tomorrow's meeting with your supervisor. How many of y'all ever had something like that happen while you were in church? Oh, yeah. If he can only distract you so that the sounds coming out of the preacher's mouth go in one ear and out the other, he will have successfully taken away the word of God and made it ineffectual for you. He also uses ill will. He causes feeling of aversion to block the word. These feelings might be against a preacher or against someone in the church or the language that was used or simply against the truth of the gospel. People may hear and understand exactly what is being said but despise it. Paul said the gospel is foolishness to those that are perishing. And Satan works to maintain their worldly sense of values so that they value, so the value of death of Christ has no meaning for us. Satan gives people such a high estimation of themselves that the evangelical message of brokenness before the cross and of our sin is disgusting and even threatening. So the word of God gains no foothold and Satan takes it away. Satan uses ignorance. Satan, the work of Satan can be so thorough that his servants actually lose the capacity to grasp what is being said. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 and 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In the case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the likeness of God. When the glory of God is described, Satan binds the eyes of his people so that they wander in the world and is going on. And uh, I'm sorry, wonder what in the world is going on when spiritual people are deeply affected by his glory. Satan takes away the word of God. Revelation 12, 9 says, Satan deceives the whole world. 
And he does. Listen, God, when he's sowing his word, it's to bring life, to bring truth, to bring healing, to bring freedom, to bring transformation, to bring salvation. And Satan's opposed to that. So what Satan does to God's word is he blinds eyes so they can't see it. He deceives them. He casts doubts on God's word. He mocks it, makes it look like it's foolish. And they're blinded. And listen, Satan has no problems with people who are extremely good people. He has got no problem with that. Are really religious. He has no problem with that. Listen, Satan has no problem with somebody that does a lot of Christian talk and even quotes the Bible and talks. He quotes the Bible. That is no threat to Satan. He, that doesn't even shake him up. What scares Satan is that word of God getting into somebody's heart and changing them. He takes that very seriously. And so, Christian, I want you to think about this too. If we were playing on teams, God's team and Satan's team, and that's a poor illustration because God is all-powerful. Satan is a created creature. It is not God against Satan. Satan's time is limited. Satan is defeated. We're in a war right now for the souls of men. God is drawing men to himself. He's trying to speak, and Satan's trying to deceive to draw them to him. And if Satan was throwing out game jerseys to people, this is who he'd throw a game jersey out to somebody. He would love to throw a game jersey out to somebody who calls himself a Christian, has God's word all over their house, who talks about well, going to church and everything else. However, during the week, lives like the rest of the world. He'd throw them a game jersey. Here you go. Thank you. Because if I can play that part and then sell drugs, slander and assassinate people's character, sleep around, get drunk, smoke dope, game jersey. Because that plucks the word of God out of the hearts of people that are what? Watching. Let me give you the other side. Here's somebody else who would get a game jersey. Somebody who is very, well, let me read the verse. Let God speak for himself. Say, that's kind of hard, Larry. It's right in the Word of God. It says, where certain people have crept in unnoticed. They are ungodly persons whose condemnation was predicted a long time ago. They distort the grace of God into decadence and immoral, immoral freedom. The King James Version, I think, has a license of immorality. Which means they take God's grace and say, hey, we can do whatever we want to because we're what? And he says, and they deny and disown the only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. What he's saying is you can say this with your lips, but your life nullifies the message. Am I making sense, church? And it plucks out the word of God. We are going to be shocked at when we were faithful and obedient and trusted God, how God used that. But I think we're going to be also as shocked when we got in the flesh or we were doing one, we were being a hypocrite, the damage we did. We were pawns of Satan. We got played. The other one is this. Satan loves a self-righteous person who is critical and judgmental and everybody else is wrong but not willing to admit their own struggle with sin. Here's the verse for that. Jesus said, Woe to you Pharisees and hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. And what he's saying is you look all pretty on the what? But on the inside you're, you're dirty, you're messed up. He's, Jesus also said in another passage, you're whitewashed tombs. You're all pretty on the outside, but inside of you is death and stinkiness and rottenness and maggots and worms. That was added by the pastor. But that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying th there's dangers in both extremes. If I say I'm a Christian and just live and do what I want to and don't care and God's going to forgive me anyway, you better be careful. Because he says your condemnation may have been written about a long time ago. And if I think I'm better than everybody else and I'm self-righteous and I'm not willing to admit my own sin and be humbly honest with, it, with the person sitting across from me and saying there's a danger in both extremes. The man or woman that Satan is threatened by is found in verse 15. We'll come to that in a minute. I'm doing that for two reasons. One, that keeps you here for the whole service since we're going to run long because of announcements. But two, we need to look at the bad before we look at the good. The second one is this. 
This is the dangerous attitude. First is Satan, if you will. Here's the second one. A superficial attitude toward God's Word. An insincere or shallow or just outward look or attitude toward God's Word. Verse 13, but the ones who are on the... Uh, the seed fell on the rock are those who, when they heard and received the word of joy, uh, received the word with joy, and these had no root, who believed for a while and in time of temptation fall away. In Israel, the soil, the topsoil is very thin, and then underneath that thin is, is some rock. And it's kind of like, I heard one illustration this weekend, it's kind of like the soil out in California. The deeper roots go in, the more moisture they can pull up. Would you all agree with that? Now, if you only have a little bit of soil, and it sprouts up real quick, it looks like every other plant, but when the sun starts to beat down or the weather starts to get hot, and what happens to the plant? And what Jesus is saying, some people respond to the Word of God that way. There's been people I have shared the gospel with, and I can still see their faces, I can still see their tears. I'm sharing the gospel with them, and they are crying, and they are emotional, and they are weeping, and I'm thinking in my heart, Holy Ghost, you are moving hard on this person. Wow, how long have you been drawing this person? And, and they pray, and then nothing. And it used to confound me. I also see, we see this at youth camp a lot, and, and I'm very cautious at youth camp. Because everything is moving just right, and, and young people are very emotional, and they get caught up in the, in the moment, and they go down, they get excited and joyful, and then they come right back and start right back where they left off. And it used to confound me. God, it, they were so excited at camp. They were so, they, they were so excited when they got back home. What, what happened? What was the fizzle? I think it's this. See, there's times that we can... Look at God's Word, but it has no place in our heart. Listen, people get excited to learn God's Word intellectually, but they don't exercise it. It moves their heart and emotion, but it never moves their will. They're receptive when they hear it or hear a sermon preached, but they're not repentant in how they're living. And the greatest joy as a pastor is when I get somebody who's never been in church in their entire life, and they get saved, they get excited, and listen, this is amazing. They read God's Word and believe it and do it. And their life is transformed. They're still struggling. They still got sinful habits. But they're transformed, and their family starts saying things like this. What's happened? What'd you do to my husband? I didn't do anything. What happened? The Word of God... And they're starting to do like the man in verse 15. Then I have people that I share with that get excited and they're pumped and they're on a mountaintop and they're, and they're just woohoo! And in three or four months, they're what? Bye, bye, bye. They're gone. It is easy. Listen, me and my wife talked about this this week. It is easy to invoke emotion. It is hard to invoke repentance. I can get people excited about God. Tell them about heaven. Tell them about promises. Tell them about how good things are. Tell them all these. But if they've got to examine their life and say, I am sinning and I need to repent. And my life needs to line up with the Word of God. That's a whole different matter. And some of y'all, I'm just going to be honest with you. I told you I'm going to meddle this morning. Y'all love for me to preach at people. Because as long as I'm preaching at everybody else. We don't have to deal with the sin and where. If I'm preaching against the homosexuals, that's great because that's them. But if I preach about gossiping, that's not good, Larry. It is good because that's, we're trying to get our lives to line up with the what? Word of God. Some of us have a superficial attitude. Judas did. Judas thought Jesus was all that in a bag of Skittles. He left and followed him, but then he realized Jesus isn't given what I thought he was given, and he did, turned around and did what to him? Betrayed him. This is the one I think we struggle with the most. This is the one your pastor struggles with the most, this attitude right here. I think we all struggle with this the most. It's an attitude of distraction. They're distracted uh, their distractions caused them to, well, let me just read the verse. Verse 14. Now the ones, talking about the seed that fell among the thorns, are those who, when they have heard, so they heard the word. All these people are hearing it. 
and they go out, or they, some translations have they go their way and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit of maturity. Let me ask you a question. Are the cares of this life a bad thing? No. Are the riches a bad thing? No. Is pleasure a bad thing? No. But they can turn bad. And what it says is they got choked out. Some people preach this as the soils are souls and the, then the seed is the gospel. But it's the word of God. I believe what Jesus is saying here is as you go on your way, as you go out, you get caught up in life and you get choked out. It's almost like weeds. I'm not a, a, a gardener. My dad turned me against that when I was young. He didn't mean to, but he did. He made us do that garden thing, and I swore when I got older I'd never do that again. I didn't see the benefit in it. I mean, you work and work and work and work, and you eat it and it's gone. <laughs> Make any sense to me? And he said, weed the garden. Now, I was ignorant. I figured you read it once, you're done. It was an everyday thing. And you know what amazed me as a young child? You don't have to plant weeds. They just kind of show up. You've got to work at the crop, but the weeds just show up. And if you have a garden, you will never see this in a Terry Carson garden. When the weeds have overtaken the garden, what does that tell you about the garden? It's been neglected. It's been neglected. And what this is saying, and this is why I think we all struggle with this. Some of us do it to ourselves. Some of us, life is doing it to us. But we were, we were made physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And all of those take energy. Now the spiritual, we got the Holy Spirit, so we have infinite energy there. But the mental, those that do mental work, lawyers, engineers, the people that are using their minds all the time, y'all know who you are? That's exhausting work. Counselors, it's exhausting because you're treading through life and you're having to think all the time. And it's mentally what? Exhausting. If you're a parent, you're mentally exhausted sometimes. And laying down and taking a nap doesn't rejuvenate it. <laughs> Thank you. It doesn't. Listen, I would much rather, you can ask my wife, I would much rather have a nine to five job working my butt off doing blue collar type work. You know why? You're physically tired. You get to see what you did. There's a finished product. You get to go home. You get to eat. You go to sleep and you're ready for tomorrow. You can be mentally wiped out, go to bed and wake up still mentally wiped out and still thinking about the things you're dealing with yesterday. And you never get to see a what? Finished product. I have to wait till heaven before I see that. Listen, our world is yelling at us physically, mentally, and emotionally. And we're giving, and we're giving, and we're giving, and we're exhausted. And some of us put ourselves on that treadmill. You'll go, and I'm not picking on any individuals. I'm picking on everybody. Me and Beth do this all the time. Got church, then deacon's meeting. After deacon's meeting, then right after that, we've got a birthday party to go to. After the birthday party, I've got to come home and do some work on some stuff that's got to be turned in on Monday, and then I've got to call and do a reminder that they get the thing printed tomorrow. That's my day today. And I will come home, and I will lay down, and I will get up, and then I'll do this. Now, I've got to be honest with you. All right, let's see. I've got the OCC meeting tonight, and then I've also got the board meeting tonight. I've got to be at the board meeting an hour early. I've got to make sure the septic system stuff is straight, and I've got to make sure that's taken care of before the board meeting. I've got to get in the board meeting and get out, but make sure it's open by 4 for Vicki. And then on top of that, I've got to meet this lady about the tornado disaster relief. And then what happens to God when that happens? He gets choked what? Busyness can lead to barrenness in a spiritual life. Are we all busy, probably too busy church, are we? Listen, we all need to take time for God. But let's be honest, aren't we all a little too busy? Mentally, 
physically and emotionally. So if I'm unteachable and I'm not open to the Word of God and I'm prideful and I'm not open to the Word of God, if I've been hurt and I'm not open to God, Satan can just pluck it right out of my life, but I can have a superficial attention to God's Word or I can be distracted from it. And listen, and all these attitudes can be true in the same time. Let me say that again. All these attitudes can be happening at the same time or the same time of day. Let me give you what happened to your pastor today so you don't think I'm just preaching at you. I got up early this morning because I had to run some stuff off to foreign, put in the bulletin, but for somebody else. So I got up early and I had a wardrobe malfunction. That put me and my wife in what we call the cycle of craziness. I can't get this and this is not right. And we got it. So we had to get a whole new wardrobe. Now I'm running a little late, but I still have the same amount of work to do. So I run up into the office. Oh, by the way, I get a phone call on the way to the office. Somebody needs an emergency crisis counseling session. So I'm on the phone. I'm on the phone while I'm multitasking now in the office. I'm getting that done. Oh, I've got to fold this stuff and get it ready for the bulletin. But I got men's. Oh, that started two minutes ago. So I run into the men's class and the guy is talking and this is what's going through my head. All right, who can I get to put this stuff in the bulletin? I need to get this out and we probably need, if I can get out of here at 945, I can. What is, what is happening right there is I'm distracted from hearing what the guy is speaking about. So I catch myself and say, oh God, forgive me. I'm practicing what I'm preaching against this morning already. I then go into our college class with our 20-somethings and we're sitting in there talking and just having a wonderful time, a good time, we, and we teach the Word and kind of focused. And as I'm teaching and God uses me, His Word speaks to me, the teacher. I'm like, oh, wow, that's good stuff. Was that me, Sam, or the Holy Spirit? That's the Holy Spirit. So now I'm practicing verse 15. And then I come over here and I get in that crazy mode again. I'm worried about time. I'm distracted again. Do you see how this works? What God desires for us to be is a Luke 8.15 Christian. Look with me at verse 15. And I, if you need to leave, leave. I won't have my feelings hurt, but I, I want you to hear this. It's an attitude of seriousness with the Word of God. Let me say that again. It's an attitude of seriousness for the Word of God. But the one that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the Word with noble and good heart, keep it whole fast and bear fruit with patience. I was brought up to have a respect for this book. But I did not let this book be serious in my life. I remember at Sharon Baptist Church, the very first Bible I was ever given, I think the church gave it to me, it was that red hardback Bible. I was walking out to meet my parents and I went to do this and I dropped it and it fell on the ground. And I cried. Because I had dropped God's Bible on the ground. I looked at it and it was scuffed up and I was worried what God thought of me treating His Word that way. When at church, if, if I had a stack of books, as a young child, you never did this. Because that puts God's Word where? You always put God's Word at the... All right, let me share something with you. My parents were good to teach me that, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. It is easier to have that kind of seriousness for God's Word. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That looks good, Sam. That makes me sound spiritual. But let me tell you who's better. You ever seen a Bible thrown up on the dashboard of a car and it's sun faded and the pages are all? That may be even better than the way I'm treating this book. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Because that guy may be picking it up every day at lunchtime and reading it and saying, what do I need to line my life up with? I'm falling short in this area. Oh, God, I'm not treating my wife the way your word tells me to. 
Oh, God, I'm provoking my children to anger when, when I'm picking on them the way I do. God, help me not do that. And he's lining his life up with the Word. Which one is Jesus talking about? The man who's dropping his Bible and worrying about it and making sure it's on top but never letting it have a place in his life? Or the guy that's letting his sun-faded Bible in the dash of his car speak to his heart? Which one is he talking about, Kenston? The first or the second? The second one. The second one. And he says this, with a noble and good heart. Now, this is what I thought. Those people are better because they have a noble and good heart, but that is not what it means. In the Greek, it means this. Both of those words, noble and good heart, refer to being beautiful, but it means beautiful in this sense. And I, I took this straight from one of the Greek books. It says, all the senses may be brought together under the idea of what is ordered and sound. What it means is the will, the mind, the desires, the core of everything we are. <coughs> Hear the Word of God. Now that's pretty good. So when I read it, my mind hears it, my heart hears it, my will hears it, my emotions hear it. And then look at the second thing it does. It says, then it, he keeps it. Some of it says hold fast. And what that word means to keep it, it means to hearken to do it. Jesus says that man will bear fruit. With what? Patience. It doesn't happen instantly. So how can I develop to be this kind of man? Because this is what Jesus is talking about. This parable isn't about that you're fated to one of those positions. You're either this soil, that soil, this soil, that soil. He's saying you're you're most likely one of those people if you're doing these things. But he says, there's a good heart and a good soil is the man who hears the word of God, lets it speak to his whole being, and he does it. That's why James says, don't be deceived. He says, don't deceive yourselves. Don't be a hearer of the word and not a what? A doer of the word. Listen, I can have all the emotions and I can listen to casting crowns in my car and get goosebumps. But if I am not lining my life up to the Word of God, it is for what? Nothing. If I give all I have to the poor and surrender my body to the flames and then live like a lost pagan during the week, I nullify the Word of God. If I don't have love in the way I'm handling the Word of God, Jesus says, you are what? Nothing. Now, Pastor, you're being a little hard on us this morning. No, I'm being hard on me. Because these next things, I looked at my life and said, how am I doing? Are you ready? Write these down. If you want to become a Luke 8, 15 Christian, the first thing you need to do is to pray to God that He will give you the desire to know Him and His Word. That's where it starts, because Satan is busy about plucking it out. We need to take time to hear God and make time to hear God. You say, Pastor, I've got so much going on in my life, I don't have time. If you've got so much going on, you need to make time. You need to make time. Listen, God, I'm learning this. God doesn't shout a lot. You know what he does, Robin? He whispers. You know what I've found out in church as y'all are singing? If somebody gets up and sings on this microphone, there's talking and rambling and moving around and everything else because everybody can hear. But if this mic isn't on, you know what happens out here? Y'all start to get quiet. Yeah, J.D. just did this. Because what you're having to do is you're having to focus in on what is being. And if, if God does speak in a whisper... We're in the quiet. We need to slow down, get quiet, and be still and know He is what? God. We need to develop roots. We need to daily spend time with God. Weekly, we need to spend time with others, whether that's in Sunday school, discipleship, or some sort of small accountability group, to share with one another what God's doing. Mary Clay texted me this week about something she read in her quiet time. And she said it with conviction and passion. She had heard that word. It stuck in your heart, didn't it? 
And she shared that with me and, and that encouraged me and I need to encourage her. And if you're not in some sort of small group and if you're definitely not coming to church regularly, you've got a problem here in God. You need to spend time weekly and yearly. I'm just telling you, this is not in the word of God. This is your pastor encouraging yearly. You need to try to read through the word of God. Learn to hear his voice. Here's the last one. You ready? Eliminate distractions. God has smacked me a little bit about that. Because what I'm finding out is I don't have a lot of time during the day. And the time that I do have when I come home, read, I just want to veg a little bit. So you know what I do? Is TV bad? Some of it's real bad. <laughs> Some of it's not bad at all. Some of it's really good. Some of it's even edifying. But I have found it's easier for me to get in neutral if I'm watching something. But I found out something even better. I found out it's easier to get in neutral if I'm praying. If I'm letting God's Word speak to me. Listen, some of y'all love Fox News and you spend hours in it. Let me show you what your heart rate does. <laughs> Why are you doing that to yourself? Cut it off. Open up the Word of God and say, God, speak to me. Your pastor has a problem with distractions. Netflix. People who don't want to hear anything that keep coming to me, they want to hear it again, they want to hear it again, and that's a distraction. <coughs> hey, I knew you were free. You only work one hour a day. You want to stop by the house to hang out? Can I talk? That's a what? It can be. It can be ministry. It depends on why they're there. If they're there to talk about politics, probably a what? Phone calls. Now listen, I'm not busting y'all. That's not what I'm talking about. I have noticed when I'm studying God's Word, something starts to happen instantly. Danielle's doing this. Preach it, brother. <laughs> Do you know why your pastor doesn't answer the phone all the time? I'm trying to focus on the task at hand. I will call you. And if I don't, I'm in trouble, but I try. As we come to the Lord's table today, I want to ask you a question. If you're not hearing from God, is it you got hurt in your life and you're blaming God instead of seeking forgiveness and putting the blame where it belongs on sinful men and Satan and you're not letting God speak to you? You may need to deal with that as you come to the table. Maybe you're just worried about all that is going on in your life and you're worrying and worrying and you want to get it fixed and so you worry some more and you worry some more and then you call friends and make them worry with you. And you're choking out the word of what? You may have be pride. You may think you're right and everybody else is what? You may be distracted like your pastor. Or you may not be taking God's word seriously. But as we come to the table today, if I can have my deacons come forward, I want you to pray to God and say, God, what is it in my life that is keeping me from you and hearing you? And be honest with yourself. Give room for the Holy Spirit to talk. Because he may come to you and say, your reason's pride. No, it isn't. It may be. You may be here and saying, I'm not hurt. And the Holy Spirit say, yes, it is. You remember? But you do some business with the Lord while they bring you the Lord's Supper. And you examine yourself to say, what is it, God, has come between me and you that I can't hear you? <coughs> do you know what the gospel's about? Let's use this phone again as an illustration. I know y'all thought I was picking some up and texting somebody right in the Lord's Supper. That's not what I was doing. I was looking up a verse. My Bible's on here too. I want to share something with you. When we talk about salvation and what this table means, and what I'm going to say is going to upset some of you, but I hope that it upsets you so you'll examine. We are never to share the gospel dangling heaven in front of people. If you do this, you can go. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell. 
Matter of fact, when I read the epistles and the letters, I don't ever see the disciples doing that. Do you know what the disciples do? They talk about the debt that you've incurred upon a holy God, a debt you can't pay, a debt that a good and holy God's going to have to deal with. And Jesus Christ has paid it what? All. They talk about that you were created by Him and for Him. They talk about the fact that you are more sinful and more wicked than you can ever admit to yourself. But they also talk you're more loved and cherished than you could ever even imagine. And then after they explain the gospel and how God has dealt with the sin debt, then they share things. No eye has seen, no ears heard, or even entered the heart of man the things God has prepared for you. What God is seeking to do is your phone is messed up. If, it's, if you were a phone, not only is your screen broke, your system is way outdated and it can't function properly. And God is seeking to talk to you and minister to you. And what you have to do is get the phone totally what? Replaced. You need to get a new phone. And then you have to give him access to change everything on it. To get rid of some apps that are in your life. Some ways of thinking need to be gone. Some of those photos need to, in your mind, need to be taken away. And so what God wants to do is wipe that clean and program you the way He designed you to be programmed. Does that make sense? The piece of bread you're holding is a reminder of the cost of that overhaul. And unlike Verizon, you don't get to pay for it. He has to pay for it and give it to you. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a what? Gift of God, not of works. So no man will boast. He wants to save you from you and your sin and make you a new creation. Let's pray. Father, your word says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. But Lord, some of us can't hear you because we refuse to give our phones up, our lives up. We forgive to surrender to you. And Satan has convinced us that all screens look broken like this and all phones don't work like this. And I pray that those who don't know you would come to know you to see all that you have for them in Christ. A new life, a new design, a new purpose, a new love, a new way of doing life. Doing it your way according to your word. Father, forgive us for being distracted for being superficial and for not taking your words seriously. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. When I was growing up, I feared my dad. I didn't fear my mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> the reason I didn't fear my mom was my mom was famous for warnings. Don't let me tell you again. Don't make you tell you again. I mean it this time. You better stop. Don't do it again. I'm going to count to three. One. I mean it. One. One. One and a half. Two. I mean it. <laughs> I learned that her word was a little what? Flexible. Now I could hear the tone and I knew what numbers to, to straighten up. But I knew up until that point it was totally flexible. The Bible says, may God be true. Well, it says this, it's a saying, God be true and every man made a liar. But the Bible does say this, that God is not a man that he should change his mind, nor that he should lie. It's found in Numbers. I'm ahead of schedule too. When my dad spoke, I knew playtime was over. He didn't give a warning, he gave a look. And that look scared me because I did not know when reality was gonna hit me 
And so I instantly straightened up. If my father or even my grandfather Hale ever said, Larry, you can sit down. Whatever followed, I did. You know why? I took their word, what? Seriously. Because when they spoke, they spoke with authority and they spoke truth. And Kenson, if I stretched that word, dad didn't count. All I knew, the next thing I know, a storm had hit me. And a broken, repentant heart was crying for acceptance. Dad didn't play. Listen, I'm sharing that to share this. God's not going to get you like that, but I want you to know His Word is that sure. He is not a liar. And if He said it, it's going to happen. And if He says you need to do it, you need to what? Do it. And if he gives a promise, he cannot break it. Does your life reflect that? Do people look at you and say, that man takes the word of God seriously. That man not only knows the word of God, he tries to live it out. That man may not be perfect, but he's trying to walk with his father. That's what we should be striving for. And when we do that, Jesus said, not only will we hear God speak, we'll bear fruit, eternal fruit. When Jesus went to the cross, his father had orchestrated those events and Jesus knew what the word of God was. And when Jesus finished everything he was called to do, he was able to say, it is what? And he knew when he died, because of the faithfulness of his Father's word, that those that placed their faith in him would be totally forgiven. He died for you and me, but really he died because he was obedient to the Father, even unto death, because he knew God's word was sure. Let's go to the word in prayer. Father, we come to your living word, Christ. We pray through him. We come to your throne. We thank you, Father, that your word, the smallest jot and tittle, will not pass away. That you will protect your word. You've exalted it even above your name. Father, help us to exalt it in our life. Father, some of us don't spend time in it. And we need to examine our life and ask why. If you died for us to build a relationship so we could hear you, help us to be receptive to listening. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can we do something different today? Well, I don't know why I'm asking. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Can we stand up and hold hands and sing Amazing Grace together as a family? I know we're running a little over, but let's sing this to the Lord who has not only died for us, but given us His words so we can hear Him. Amen. And if we can sing it, Amazing Grace, and we'll do it a cappella. Okay, she said, uh huh. All right. Let's, uh, let's sing. I'll start it and then y'all follow out. All right, ready? Amen. Uh,